Hello and good afternoon and welcome to Regional Arts Australia's Artlands Conversation Series. My name is Scott Howey and I'm the Regional, uh, the General Manager for Regional Arts Australia. I'm joining you today from Wiradjuri country, from Wagga Wagga, the place of dance and celebration. Regional Arts Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land throughout Australia, and we pay our respects to elders past and present. I'm delighted to welcome you today to the ninth session of the Artlands Conversation Series, Art Attack, carrying on the conversations or how to get teenagers to come to your party. The Artlands Conversation Series is supported by the Australian Government's uh, Regional Arts Fund. And, um, We'll start with just a little housekeeping. As you can see, today's session uh, is Auslan interpreted and closed captioning is available. If you wish to enlarge the view of the Auslan interpreters, scroll over the top right hand corner of their video panel and there is a drop down menu where you can select pin video. This will make their screen larger. There are two Auslan interpreters today, Catherine and Sean, and they'll interpret for about 15 minutes each and then swap over. So you'll need to pin each interpreter to maintain the larger screen size. Please, at the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll see a chat icon and a QA and a icon. Please say hello in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. And the Q&A can be used um, if you have any questions throughout the time to the panelists, and we will um, answer those questions and answer them towards the end of the session. Um, so as I said before, today's topic is Art Attack, carrying on the conversations. Art Attack was a multifaceted project facilitated by Asking for Trouble Physical Theatre based in Clunes, Victoria. The program engaged over 70 young participants in the rural community over almost three years. Um, and being embedded in the community as artist facilitators, Asking for Trouble developed a responsive methodology based around conversation, continually shifting Art Attack work with young people to co-produce a creative vision resulting in five short films. In today's session, artist and project director Christy Flores will be speaking with the evaluator Ember Parkin about how curiosity and conversation helped Art Attack respond to young people's desires for a Halloween disco and a Get Fit boot camp. Uh, just a very brief intro to each of our um, conversationalists today. Dr. Ember Parkin has a doctorate in sociology, uh, sociology and is an experienced consultant with a great depth of knowledge about place, rural and regional issues, young people and history and heritage. Her expertise in research, stakeholder engagement, relationship building, strategy development and implementation and evaluation. Over the last 17 years, Christy has performed and facilitated workshops and directed community performance and arts projects, both independently and for a variety of organisations, including Circus Oz, Westside Circus, the Arts Centre, Polyglot Theatre, the Women's Circus, Kids Own Publishing, and the Fairfax Youth Initiative. Thank you both for joining us today, Amber and uh, Christy, and I hand over to you. Thanks so much. Oh, I, I, I love the, I love the how, to, how to get teenagers to come to your party, because I feel like that is, that is such a common approach, and I, I'm really grateful that, that you put it that way, because I think the thing that I had done for years and years and years was was being in a position where I had the party planned and whether that was by a fantastic arts organisation or a community health organisation. And I think for me, Art Attack was really about approaching it from another angle of going, hey, do you want a party? What would the party look like? What thing, what are the ingredients that would actually make it a party that you would want to come to? And I, yeah, we've been talking, Imbra and I have been talking about that a bit today. Um, I'm zooming today from Jajarang country and Clunes, um, which is, yeah, I was just thinking before about how um, it's also described as upside down country, which when I first heard that as a circus artist, I was just like, upside down country, that sounds amazing, um, but have really kind of clocked uh, what that means to Jarrah people in terms of just the land and, and what work there is to, to take care of it. Um, yeah, so I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and in particular um, various amazing Aboriginal people who have uh, been so generous um, to me in my arts practice and, and process of learning. Ember, um, 
Good go. Thank you. <laughs> yes, also from Queens on Jajawaran country and, and, and I think the, the concept of upside down country kind of resonates because you can see everywhere through the landscape the impacts of gold mining on this land and that the, the sort of utter upheaval and transformation that would have occurred during that gold rush. Um, and, and so sort of like to also pay my respects to judge around people and, and acknowledge that our reconciliation is ongoing business <laughs> that we still sort of all have to work towards together. Um, so I just wanted to also like open the conversation, I guess, by giving a little bit of context about Clunes and, and where it is and that acknowledging that this is a national forum, um, national conversation. So Clunes is a very small um, Victorian goldfields town of under 2000 people. Because it is a goldfields town, it's got beautiful heritage infrastructure. There's this amazing town hall, there's beautiful old banks and post office buildings and sort of far richer and greater infrastructure than what the kind of current community could um, create for itself. Um, the, the town, you know, like a lot of Australian small country towns has a high median age, it has an ageing population. Um, it has an increasingly stratified population as uh, places, you know, events like our Clint's Booktown Festival, um, has been operating for the last 12 years now and and, um, and has been sort of marked as a, a really great thing for the town in terms of raising the profile and bringing new people in. At the same time as that's happening, it's gentrifying and it is stratifying more because we, ha we have sort of different communities, has the potential to become more um, sort of divisive and, and separated. Um, so I think this context is really important in terms of understanding an arts and a social impact program that's taken place here for young people. Um, I guess the other bit of kind of context is that, that there's one primary school here, there's no high school. We're zoned into four different high school zones. So like in 2019, I think that they had 16 grade six students from the primary school go to eight different high schools. So there becomes this real rupture at the age of 12, 13 or, uh, of like who you see on a daily basis and, and where your social connections might be. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll hand over back to Christy to sort of talk about asking for trouble and arriving here and, and whether she did or didn't want to become a sort of embedded in community artist, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, we, um, uh, my partner Luke and I, uh, predominantly had done a combination of touring of theatre works, often for families and community based projects, which were very much fly in, fly out, which I think in Australia is a really common model where, you know, you've got, there's a little bit of funding and you go somewhere and you make something very, very fast with a, with a group of, of people. Um, and we kind of assumed we would keep doing that. And that was, that kind of was working for us. And then uh, Clunes Neighbourhood House, around the time that we, uh, arrived in Clunes uh, was really taking quite a strong interest in arts led renewal. So um, you're looking at ways to incorporate arts in the, the social activities that were happening in town. Um, so we, we did a little Christmas circus workshop and then we met some young people and we were like, oh, this is nice. <laughs> and, and then later on when there became an opportunity to work with us, there was a little bit of local funding that was available and we did a three day development similar to what we had done in other communities. Short period of time, um, let's do something quickly together. Um, the thing that had happened before that is that we, we'd started to make a, com a conversation happen between us and the local primary school. Whenever we were going to do a show, we would do a dress rehearsal for the, for the students there. Um, pretty like rough and ready, no lights, just, you know, an opportunity for us to run a show in with an audience. Um, so the young people, a bunch of young people in town started to get to know us. And so when we had that, that first little foray into community arts practice with, um, with the neighbourhood house, you know, they were expecting, a, you know, I think five to 10 young people to turn up and we had 30 um, turn up for a three day uh, creative development. And then we did a, a a show in and around the swimming pool. Uh, we collaborated with uh, Ken Evans and Rebecca Russell on that one. Um, and then, you know, the next year we just had people coming up to us in the IGA going, when are we going to do another thing? Like, we want to do more stuff. Can we do more stuff? When can we do more stuff? And 
Uh, and so I applied for a regional arts fund grant. We did in the deep end, which was a circus show that we spent you know, a bit more time developing and that ended up, um, you know, we did, we did a show in Clunes, but we also took the show to Trentham Swimming Pool and then through Regional Centre for Culture, we were able to take it on the road to Newstead. So those young people had the opportunity to, to take a circus show on tour effectively. Um, out of, yeah, out of that, the, we started having these conversations with some of the teenagers in town. That, that first foray into working with young people had mostly been those primary age students. And I felt like, you know, I, I started to notice that there were some young people who were just kind of sussing out what was going on. And the neighborhood house had had a, a bike group that was being facilitated by Tom Rippon. And there was a, a youth group that, that was, uh, had been doing some music based projects. And so um, I was invited to come in into one of their their yeah, youth group meetings and just to introduce myself and to start a conversation. Um, and it was lovely. And I just really enjoyed hearing, oh, my internet is unstable. Um, so Creative Victoria started a, uh, had a, had a program that they launched called Future Makers for Change. Um, and some of the things that they were looking at supporting were, were social impact uh, projects, which were around a variety of different things. And one of those things was around social cohesion and youth mental health and wellbeing, which we had this moment of going, we've had the conversation, we know these young people are keen to participate. Um, and we really wanted to do co-design. We really wanted to make, um, be in a position where we could design with them from the very, very start. And because we'd already started those conversations, uh, it felt like we were just in a really, really good position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, so I guess then this, this grant came about and a social impact grant that was um, received um, by a Queen's Neighbourhood House in partnership with Asking for Trouble. The Neighbourhood House had already been doing a bit of work in, in really engaging um, a, a, a fairly small cohort, but it, a really um, a cohort with high level of need for engagement in Queen's um, around by just having a youth space, by running some music programs. So, they were able to sort of capitalise on an existing, I guess, a base of base level of trust and and, and connection. Um, and the the grant, the Art Attack grant, was um, I think as Christy mentioned, sort of targeted at, at building social cohesion and mental well being for young people. And and I think particularly given that sense of young people sort of disappearing off to multiple different high schools and then coming back to a town where they no longer connect they might sort of pass each other on the school bus route and that's about it um, so there was a real desire to create um, an you know multiple opportunities to connect and and to be seen as kind of leaders and valuable contributors to this small rural town um, so Christy and Luke kind of started, launched the program with a, um, we'll pay you pizza and 10 bucks to give us your ideas, kind of a consultation. And I thought this was really interesting because it was about sort of saying, actually, we really value what young people have to say and, and we're going to treat you like our consultants. I mean, it's, you know, it's cheap, cheap. <laughs> cheap consultant but um, it was an honorarium <laughs> an honorarium we're going to pay you to come give us give you some pizza and and start a conversation and and you know from what i've heard those conversations are really um uh, a sort of building of a sense of possibility as much as you know tell us your ideas but um, I think the, or you can talk about this probably more directly, Christy, but, you know, having ideas of, idea walls of potential projects that you could do so that you could actually open up some of the young people's possibility structures of what they thought might be possible. Whereas if you start the conversation with a blank slate and you're talking to people that, mm. you know, might not have had much broad experience outside of school and home and clunes, I, I, you know, how do they know what to ask for? So what happened when someone asked for a roller coaster? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
when we put the application in, I, I just feel like it was a bit of a miracle scenario where when I put, when we put the application in, I said, look, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Mm. Like, these are people who I value really highly as facilitators that I would love to bring onto the project. They say they want to be involved, but we have to, we have to design, like for it to be co-designed, we actually need to be open to what that outcome is going to be. So it's the first um, opportunity that I feel like I've had as an artist to go, you just need to trust us and here are the people who are going to be involved. And so I'm just like incredibly grateful for that. But what that meant was we could have, you know, a, a, we had a shipping container that we were utilizing as a consultancy kind of space. And we just had butcher's paper of like all of the, the things that, that people wanted to, to suggest as options. And, and I guess it was, for me, what, what it felt like my role was within that was just to keep encouraging. Yeah, I, I can't promise that we'll give you all of these things, but can you just tell me, tell me who you are and what you're interested in and what, what you feel like is missing and what you, yeah, what feels juicy and amazing. And then to kind of pick, pick into those conversations a bit more. So it's like a starting point to go roller coaster. What is that about? It's like doing something new or going to Melbourne or like screaming and being scared with people. And, and so I think that that became my role is to go, what is that about? What is that thing? Because yeah, I think for a lot of um, the, the other thing that we did was we put uh, like bios of all of the, the different artists who had a practice of working with young people that I knew from, you know, the, the couple of decades that I'd been spending um, collaborating on community arts projects. Um, and, and we had like, here's some examples of what they've done with the people. Um, on the wall so they could look at the, the artists and they could see their faces and they could kind of get a sense of yeah of what might be possible um, a little bit about um about things that that um are worth mentioning is like it was just real desire to be in costumes to to dress up and there was this real kind of interest in kind of gothic um uh, like Halloween style makeup and um, there was there had been discos years ago but there hadn't been any recently and so I felt like my job was to be a bower bird to like collect all the things and wait for the right time when we could put them together and it could create an outcome as opposed to like having a really clear trajectory towards making something that we had already decided um, yeah Shall we, is, is that a good time to show the film? Yeah, I reckon, I reckon so. Um, um, so do you want to talk about to... how it came about while I figure out? Yeah, how... sure. So, I mean, I guess the, um, the only other thing that I wanted to say was I feel like it's a, um, that, that practice of having to, to work really quickly. I think it's something that a lot of, um, artists who work in kind of community practices like you need to have a way of connecting and getting to know who's in the room quite quickly so that you know what you've got to work with and who your collaborators are and so um, with this particular um, project we had had I'd heard murmurings about <laughs> about Billie Eilish a lot of the young people were like Billie Eilish is really cool and I was like okay cool Billie Eilish is cool that's good to know quick <laughs> and then um, another group of young people were, were talking about how you know they used to do dance when they were little kids but there wasn't anywhere to do stuff in in clunes and it was too hard for them to travel to Ballarat to do dance classes and I was like oh yeah okay Billie Eilish dance in the meantime um was talking to another young person who had said I really want to do special effects makeup and I was like well okay, tell me a bit more about that and ended up seeing this like horrifically gory zombie style amazing <laughs> Uh, I spent quite a lot of time talking to this particular young person, trying to figure out who the who the te teacher might be. And at some point, I was like, uh, you know, we were we were trying to get a sense of who who we might be able to bring to Clunes. And and it was, there was this really wonderful moment where she was like, I don't need a teacher. I have YouTube. And I was like, Oh, 
okay, well, what do you need? Like, what is it that you need? And she was like, I just need the materials. If you can give me some of the, like, I need this fake blood and I need latex and I need, and so basically what we were able to do because of the open um, nature of the, of the grant, it was, at, you know, this was materials that we needed. So she got those and she did a bunch of experimentation with, with zombie makeup. And then I think around that time, Billie Eilish did um, a particular song, which was uh, called, I can't even remember what the actual name of it was. Uh, Very Friend. And we had set up a series of, um, of regular monthly activity days, which we called the Set Day Project. Um, because the young people were really clear that they didn't want just school holiday activities. They wanted something that was more regular than that and that happened throughout the year. So we went with a kind of a model of a monthly Saturday event. So one, uh, one Saturday we had a, a, a friend of mine came up and um, uh, ran a, a dance, a lyrical hip hop dance workshop to that song, to the Billie Eilish song. And in the meantime, the zombie makeup stuff is happening and then finally we had a couple of young people go oh we should make a we should make a film and so uh, over a period of i think four months those things came together um and we ended up with an outcome it wasn't an outcome that i had planned i had no desire <laughs> as an artist to make uh horror pop music videos but it was perfect. It was the right people. It was the right time. And it had just this beautiful way of, of evolving. So yeah, we might show you, show you what yeah. that looks like. I'll share it now. as an outsider as the evaluator and, and watching what was happening 
when this group of amazing kids were taking over the town hall, um, I got to see a, a lot, just a lot of joking around, but a lot of showing off skills and, you know, the people that were doing the makeup, the, some of the young men, they didn't want to have their makeup and they were all a bit like this, but then when they saw the outcome, they were absolutely gobsmacked and amazed. And so I think that transformation between, um, you know, the sort of before and after <laughs> of seeing, you know, the, the pride and that sort of togetherness and how they described it was part of this sort of feeling like part of something bigger and really um, also seeing that sort of behind the scenes and the really technical equipment that the filmmaker uh, Chris Bennett had that he brought to the, um, to the party. Um, they, you know, they were just amazed and it was a really um, just vibing thing to be a part of or to, to witness and to see those young people being a part of. Um, yes, Christy. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I just feel like it's, it's interesting because I feel like one of the things that I find fascinating with this with this work is that often people will be like, ah, oh, you know, the, the outcome of the videos and, and seeing the outcome of the videos. Whereas for me, I'm like, we had like 27, 12 to 25 year olds turn up on their Friday and Saturday night mm. to hang out and make it a thing together. And, and it's, and I guess it's that like, you know, and I think pe people who work with, you know, these, these are not, these are not all theatre theatre kids. These are not all young people who would have necessarily actively engaged in an arts project or felt like that was a place for them. So for me, um, I, yeah, and and I guess it's that thing of like working with that. I love working with the theatre kids, but I also just there's something really dynamic about just the uh, the things when you're working with somebody who doesn't have that language. Um, yeah, which I just yeah really loved. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, even that night on the Friday night, I think that one of the young men turned up and he hadn't really engaged before, but he knew that this was going to be a sort of safe and interesting space. And, uh, yeah. you know, I think he had he had a lot of feelings going on and he wanted to crack a whip and there was someone yeah. there that could help him crack the whip. So he did that yeah. for two hours <laughs> and got really good and, at and it. And he came yeah. back the next day. So <laughs> that's what I think, that, you know, the joys of having that sort of sense of openness and, and inclusion, like real inclusivity for people, um, you know, brought about, uh, I, I think, probably what was a bigger than expected or bigger than we were maybe set up for level of participation. Yeah. 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 Um, which I, I guess, I mean, I don't know if you want to do the, the, the list of the things that happened because I, you know, this was, this was one example of one of the many, I, I feel like I, I feel in pain a lot and probably the Clunes neighborhood house a fair bit as well <laughs> with my desire to be as responsive as possible. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, like I could go through a list of what was achieved during this program and it's why I had a bit of a headache as an evaluator. Um, and someone that lived in the community, so I couldn't just skive off and not be seen by Christy and Luke. Um, so, you know, it was this Im an immense, really multifaceted program, this sort of core spine of circus skills ran throughout it, I think, because that's what um, Christy and Luke were expert at, and, and, um, and that's what sort of drew people to want to engage a bit as well. So, you know, they did, um, even classes not just for the sort of teenagers or the 12 to 25 year olds, but they did preschool and primary school classes and implemented training trainers of the sort of people in the target age group to go and help with those classes. Um, some of the young women had a um, desire to do circus, but not in front of men or boys. So they um, started a women's circus for that. So, so broader sort of people in the community also got to benefit um, from this and it was all on a pay-as-you-feel model, a pay-as-you-can, so um, some people would pay and some people, it, there were no barriers to participation at all. Um, there was, you know, the, and I think in the, in the um, brief blurb about the talk today is, you know, what do you do with when some kids want a boot camp? And it's an arts program <laughs> that you're running. <laughs> so, so Christy and Luke had this really, really open 
Friday night circus boot camp. It was it was a different structure. It was much more open and, and responsive to those young people. That was typically the older teenagers that wanted that, that came along to that. And and really focused on very particular skills that they wanted to learn, as well as showing them some new things that they would never have thought of wanting to learn. Um, while kind of allowing them to call it a boot camp so that because that was what they expressed the desire for. Um, and, you know, there were residencies with different um, performing artists who would come and do a performance for the whole community to sort of build that sense of cohesion right across the community um, while also building an arts audience locally and in quite, you know, just joyous and hilarious kind of, um, with, with joyous and hilarious performance. So, so everyone's sort of coming together with that real sense of like, just laughter and joy. <laughs> um, and and that those performances would bring together like the whole cross section of the community from sort of elderly people, you know, retired, middle class people that like to go hang out at the cafes to the people um, that, you know, farmers and, and people that might be unemployed or people uh, who had young families and big groups of teenagers coming together and they, they would all come, all come together. Um, then there was a magazine group that focused on, you know, a small group of about eight people who wanted to do writing and illustration and, and, and work on the sort of those kind of skills. There was a face painting group. <laughs> I'm still, the list is only halfway through. Um, it was a face painting group, so, um, you know, that expanded from the young woman that Christy was talking about who um, wanted to explore her special effects makeup and, and they had somebody come up and do some training with them so that they could go and work at public events and, and actually be paid for it, right? Which, yeah, well, and actually, so the, so the face painting crew happened because, um, because I'm in the community and because people talk to each other, the face painter wasn't available for the Queen's Market one weekend. And they were like, uh, you know, we've got three days to find someone new. Do you know, like, would any of you, young, the young people, be interested? And I got on the phone to Kiara Thordoburn, who I knew, you know, as a circus artist, but also had a face painting business. And I was like, do you want to come mentor these young people and supervise them? to do the face painting for the market and you know I, I think it's I guess it's that broader understanding of what arts practice might be and what creative practice might be and what leadership might might be and I think that those yeah the thing that I really enjoy doing is trying to find those connecting points between what's happening in the community these young people were teaching circus um, you know juggling and manipulation and doing a little show as part of the Booktown Festival but equally at Christmas and Clunes there were stilt walkers and unicyclists and we did a little performance there as well so I felt like that was it was just so satisfying to have the resources to be able to go ah there's this opportunity to be able to do this thing which kind of leads us into where we were at at the end of 2019, start of 2020, um, which was, you know, in March, we had two local markets uh, lined up where we'd, be, we'd just started working with these young people on a, a little street show that they were going to do. They were going to be the trainee trainers who were going to facilitate circus workshops at, at Talbot Market and at Creswick Market. And then we we didn't do those things because COVID happened. Um, and yeah. Oh. Oh. Um, what is that? Like it was building such momentum and such um, a great broad engagement right throughout the community. And then there was yeah. COVID. So, you know, that was a thing that everybody here has had to deal with and especially as artists and arts managers. It's like, it's been, it's been a hell of a ride. Um, but I think what happened was also, you know, like everybody was saying pivot, pivot, and let's not say that word again, but um, uh, I feel like this project had been pivoting right from the start because it had been um, completely responsive to the young people and, and in some ways their ideas weren't necessarily, there wasn't necessarily a clear pathway to enact their ideas, so it was kind of responding and shifting accordingly. Um, and then when, when there were lockdowns, there, people were saying, oh, you must go online, do, do stuff online. And it just, 
it just wasn't going to wash. Like everything in that program was so visceral and based in this physical and social connection. And, and, and I think you'd had it kind of proved from your, you know, um, the way Asking for Trouble had managed a Facebook group for the Art Attack participants. They would like things online and that would be it. There'd be no conversation. All of the conversations had to happen in another, in another forum, not in a public kind of online context. Um, and I think mm -hmm. even when there were videos, you made some training videos, you and Luke, and, and they got very few views because it wasn't, it wasn't about the actual thing. It was more than that. It was about this sort of coming together and those building of connections. And um, that was what was driving the, the engagement, I think. So <laughs> then, then what happened, Christy? <laughs> so we, we made some videos and we got like 11 views and we were like, this is not, this is not a good use of resources right now. Um, so we paused and I feel like we did a lot of planning for things that didn't happen, like many of us. Um, but what we did manage to do was um, as soon as we were able to, we, we went physically outside. So we did a bunch of um, physical training. A lot of our work that we'd done with young people um, had been around partner acrobatics, physically uh, trusting each other, holding each other. And, and I feel like I still, I still grieve the loss of that. We didn't get to, to do that. That just, it, it had to um, be let go of. Uh, but we, we met as soon as we could and we started talking about what, what could we do. Um, we had thought that we might have some film element as a kind of final outcome alongside a live theatre um, performance, circus performance. And it just became really obvious that we didn't have the resources anymore to, to kind of just keep, keep waiting. And so we talked to the young people about, well, do we want to just create a series of films? Like we really loved making that film together. Should we do that? What would, what would the films be about? What would we want to do? Um, yeah. And, and so there was, there was a point at which I was like, are they actually going to turn up? Like we've, we've had this massive, gap of time where I've had no contact, you know, no, no longer running into people in the main street, no longer running into each other at the IGA, those kind of incidental, which actually was a really core part of the design of the program was the incidental nudges in particular directions. Um, yeah, so, so we, we, created, um, we created a series of films and they're quite different. Um, I wonder, do we want to show that the movement won? Yeah. And I feel like maybe we'll show it and then I can speak to it. Yep. But that might be the right order. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure thing. It takes a lot to run away. It takes just as much to stay. Did I share sound? Yeah, that was, yeah. <laughs> can you be brave if there's nothing to prove? How do you rebel if there's nothing to do? How do you rebel if there's nothing to do? To do. There's nothing to do.
I don't care about nature. But look at the view. Sightsee a gold mine. Maybe two. I'm skating in circles. The wind in my hair. Got homework to finish. I really couldn't care. The hills are all around me, free from a crease, building up for so long. It's tension and release. It's tension and release. Tension. Release. It takes so long to run away. It takes just as much to stay. Can you be brave if there's nothing to prove? How do you rebel if there's nothing to do? It takes a lot to run away. It takes, it takes just, just as much, much to stay. Can you be brave if there's, there's nothing to prove? How do you rebel if there's, there's nothing to do? do? about the um I think what was really interesting about that that film in particular is the what the young people were sort of asking for what they were expressing they wanted to do given that this is in being produced in November last year after we'd had very long lockdowns mm. yeah um so when we were gathering outside we had the I, I wrote lots of um I had lots of like little index cards and we just wrote cards down together of like wh what locations do you want to do you want to film at what kind of images do you want to create just to try and kind of start to get some ideas and we had like 50 location cards I was just like I, I don't like I thought maybe we'd end up with two or three the town hall you know that zombie film at the town hall came directly because they were like we never get to do stuff at the town hall and i was kind of expecting a couple of locations but it was really interesting this the, just all of these places and places that i hadn't been to and so we were like okay so we need to have a film where we go to locations like we, we need to go to some of these places that's really important um there was uh one young person who we'd wanted to get some parkour training happening for the whole of the program and we just hadn't managed to line it up um we've been doing a bunch of movement stuff with him, but he really wanted to work with some, some parkour practitioners. And so it became an opportunity when, you know, when we were able to, we, we worked with Walk the Walls Parkour and they came and did a, a, a really amazing couple of sessions on a day. Um, so it was about that particular young person and getting that parkour thing happening for him. Um, we had one young person who was like, you know, when we asked what kind of things could you do in these films, you know, we happened to know that she did survival swimming and she could swim in for a really long time in her clothes and like just becomes this kind of collage of like what you know about these young people from working with them for a year and you know another young person who was like I can run for a really long time I just love running and and I guess that for me that film is is really about uh was really about hearing what those young people really enjoyed doing and just being like that can be a film like we can we can do something that is about what you love and what your bodies love. And we can go to those places that you, that you want to celebrate about your local area. Um, and yeah, I feel like those are the, the things. And, and also they really wanted um, in winter 2019, we didn't quite manage it, but we wanted to get team hoodies made. <laughs> like they all wanted like hoodies. And so for that program, I was like, costume, brilliant. You all want black hoodies. I have a costume budget. Let's get a bunch of black hoodies. Um, yeah, 
just noticing the chat cat saying funding that allows you to say yes i just feel like it's so rare and i just feel like it would be amazing to see more of that kind of trust that um that we will find the ways <laughs> we will find the ways in the conversations to do the things that are relevant for those young people um yeah as opposed to planning it beforehand and then um, trying to market it you know <laughs> we're going to do this really fun thing that we've come up with you'll really like it and i feel like you know you get young people turning up to that but it was just you know which i guess leads us to one of the challenges is like what do you do when you're expecting a group of 20 young people to participate in a program you're running and you end up with 70 um which is you know lessons learned is what it is i think for both asking for trouble and also clean's neighborhood house is that scope creep of yes we like to say yes and we can you say yes and when it's your community and you want to keep saying yes um yeah that's that's a thing yeah yeah thing. and yes and if you said yes for so long what happens when you can't say yes anymore you have to say no and uh, you know who draws the short straw mm -hmm. of being said no to um so and i, I noticed as the evaluator i think both christy and asking for trouble and um Lana from the manager from the neighborhood house said both very much yes people can do can make things happen um so if anything comes as a learning from that it's like probably like just slow down a bit ease up pull back and maybe you know like make some time and space in there for um I guess partnered reflection rather than like Christy and Luke having their artistic process constant reflection is always happening but probably everyone is so busy it didn't quite happen between the groups as much as it could have just trying to think of you know i don't want to end on a negative note because i know mm -hmm. we've got to go to q a right now but also you know it's there's a lot of complexities and nuances to how this was rolled out that as with every project you would do something differently next time mm. Yeah, and I, and I mean, the only other thing that we talked about, Ember, was just around um, the the lack of an ending. And so mm -hmm. I think for me, and reflecting on that, moving forward, we are definitely looking at more of a model where we, we are really, really clear around the ending of things, um, which, yeah, I think, I mean, we can speak more to that if people are interested, but it would be great. Um, yeah, I feel like we should open up to Q and A. Is there other things that you wanted to mention before we do that? Uh, that? I guess just to very quickly kind of summarize or highlight the, that in the evaluation, um, there was a sense, you know, a very strong sense that the whole program really, really kicked goals in terms of what it stated in the theory of change model that we used to sort of set up the evaluation framework around um you know the stated goals of enhancing social cohesion and, and mental well-being for young people um and and really in terms of people that were interviewed they, their social connections were deeper and stronger they had more people that they could call on if they needed help they've you know actively volunteered you know just being asked a very open-ended question what has changed for you most out of being in, involved in Art Attack, they would openly volunteer. Well, I've got better social skills now, and I'm, you know, like it, it was as if you wanted to feed them the outcomes of the grant, like what you wanted them to say, but they were just so clear on it. So it was, I think it was very, very clear that it kicked goals that way. Um, and, and I think there's complexities in the fact that Christy and Luke live in the community it kind of helped to drive and build the project um, and and in terms of the participation as well like like you know i was catching the train to chris with christy to work and got completely rejected while she went after after <laughs> the teenager to talk to her about what they wanted to do so you know these things would happen regularly regularly um the incidental conversations with young people or with their parents at the um you know outside the iga or or just in Collins Place or at school drop-off or preschool drop-off or whatever um, would happen a lot and, and that's been fantastic and a really great way of sort of building that momentum but also it's it adds a muddiness to it around you know that notion of sort of 
friendships and doing things with and for your friends and and um the relation you know it's a very relational project and i don't think we we've sort of had a reflection session on it but i don't think we've quite cleared out exactly and it probably will stay quite muddy for for a while about what actually yeah. what, what it is to work with young people when yeah. your own child goes to the local primary school yeah. and has at that primary school and you know just being able to to really clearly put hats on and yes. off and is people a are babysitting or they're you know um needing a lift somewhere or you know so what do you do and where's the borders i guess i know we've got to go to the q a but the other thing i'd say is that structurally and systemically issues came up that I feel mm. like that sentence was backwards but they the issues arose that were far greater than what this um partnership and what this grant was or the people in this grant were sort of able to really address and and that was a big challenge i think like you know issues around education and access to, to education issues around housing or um uh, mental well-being that were, were much deeper than sort of just building confidence um and issues around um you know whether, whether it might be family services or other things so this deep-seated social issues and structural issues that can't just be fixed by throwing in an arts project, even though the arts can do a lot. But I feel like it's a great burden on artists. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. This has been um, great. Lots of people are sort of talking about the inspiring nature of your, your conversation. Um, I've got a few questions, so we might... Um, get started i mean yeah. christy um the you mentioned words like slow and trust and process and co-design and unknown um not things that usually you would write in a funding application have you got any tips for anybody about how you actually got this project um funded look i think for us um the thing that really worked was it actually it was it was a progression of it was we did those shows on that school we built that little relationship with that school where we offered a like you know it was an hour of our time once a year for a couple of years and then we did a three-day project and then we did a you know a, a three-week project and I, I feel like uh that was i think the reason i mean i i wasn't an assessor obviously but i feel like the thing that we demonstrated was we have this relationship um with this community and we've we've maintained it over a period of time um I, I just noticed a question in the chat from Layla around how do we introduce this project to the community and I feel like that that first conversation that I had with that local youth group that we didn't have any funding at that point so I think starting the conversations before before anything <laughs> you know like having that conversation I didn't feel like I I, I found out what they were interested in and then I built from there. So that idea of that conversation being the starting point. And I and we were really clear that we didn't want to end up in a position where we were we're reliant on grants within our own community to make a living. Like that we didn't want to we didn't want to create that situation. What we wanted to do was to go, hey, we're here, where it's us, let's talk about it. If it's not, that's cool too. You know, that, that idea of being able to like be generous, but equally just go, if this isn't something you're interested in, then that's cool. And you know, there are other places we can go. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's another question in there about the ending of things. Well, I think there's there's probably a couple um, of questions here around the legacy, around um, uh, yeah, yeah. What, about that uncertain ending. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about that. What next? Yeah. Um, so uh, Imbra and I were talking today about just like actually the grief of, of what the last couple of years have meant for us and the arts, you know, and what and, and what that like for, for us, um, not to mention the kind of personal life stuff that we've all been managing, but just to kind of go um, at this point, what we are looking to do is to actually just take to actually take a take a rest <laughs> over um, over summer and our plan in terms of future projects is to really 
be in conversation again, be in conversation, look at what people want to do and, and do a really kind of a smaller scale, um, a series of smaller scale projects. Um, but what I guess I mean in terms of the, the ending being muddy is, you know, people have my phone number. My friends who are in my community are like, hey, when are you going to do another thing? <laughs> and that, that is something that is not just within my community, but within, you know, I, I guess my practice as an artist is I, I really enjoy being available and being accessible to people. And so I think that that's going to that's gonna be ongoing. People going, we, we, we want to know what you're doing next. We, we want to, when are you going to start circus classes again? When is this going to happen? And yeah, and I think we've learned a lot of, about being mindful of the limits of our capacity and going, okay, we want to keep doing things here. We're going to need to be really careful about how much we commit and for that to be able to continue to happen. Yeah, it's um, interesting because I think it's, I mean, you're almost sort of, you know, the, the resident arts team in the community in the same way that your community's got a plumber. And everyone's going to call the plumber when they want some plumbing done and everyone's going to call you when they want to participate in some art practice um but i think that's it's amazing and i'm so grateful but yeah yeah but i mean maybe that maybe that is pointing to something in the future that actually we need to work out ways to just fund artists and creative facilitators to just live in their communities and 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 work with their community you know, yeah, I, I do feel like I want to highlight some of the amazing work that the Creative Recovery Network are doing. Um, it's They've created some incredible resources that I wish were around uh, a few years ago, um, just in terms of thinking about community practice and, and what things you need to have in place and what conversations are useful to have with partners and other stakeholders at the start of projects. Um, there's some incredible checklists and conversation starter um, questions and it's just, they've done some incredible work. And I'm, I think one of the other questions is, if we're funding artists and facilitators in community, who, is, who are their supports? Yes. Like, who, who are the supports and, and what happens when, you know, the larger structural issues of our communities and of our, you know, our society become apparent to an artist. And I think that's something that um, I've been in conversation with, you know, quite a few artists about is, you know, as as our, our roles and communities around facilitation and uh, and working with people who have experienced trauma, for instance, or, you know, those, like, those things come up when you work in a sustained way in a community. And I think that it's definitely something I'm thinking more and more about is like, what are the, structures that I need to have in place and what is the governance that needs to be there in terms of uh, supporting partnerships and stakeholders to just to make sure that everyone is being looked after. Right um, and look there's lots of little comments running in about um, um, what would happen to get longer term memories and interviews with them with the young people later. Um, and I've just got one question for you and then we might finish up, which is, um, were you able to sort of benchmark or compare this um, project to a more, I guess, top heavy design Ooh. project? I did not do that. It felt like, um, uh, it felt like quite a unique thing. So that could be a good thing to kind of look at in terms of, of, next as well or for or for arts organizations who are wanting to work in that more grassroots kind of way to actually go you know you can use this and christy was just saying she'd be happy to sort of share the evaluation report with people that are interested um but to use as a as an example of how you might do this work in that way and 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 to build on the lessons that have been learned here in clunes um but, you know, I didn't do any sort of comparison with other um, or, or user benchmark. Um, it was very much just here now. <laughs> OK, well, look, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for um, letting us get some insight into this project. And it's so wonderful to see um, such a long term relationship based project happening. Um, so. 
please uh, thank you to um, Christy and Ember. Thank you to our captioners as well and our Auslan interpreters, Sean and Kat. And um, we look forward to you um, attending our next Artlands Conversations after Christmas in February. Thank you all for coming and uh, really enjoyed it. Bye. Thank you so much for having us. It's been great.